Okay, so um, the, the art gallery at the University of San Francisco is uh, having an art exhibition titled Pulled Apart. And uh, uh, the, the, the curator uh, will tell us more in a second about it, uh, for which a number of artists were invited to explore the intersection of art and engineering. <clears throat> uh, the way we uh, structured this evening uh, is this. So first we have uh, Gloria Simmons, who is the art curator, uh, and will tell us about uh, a little bit about this exhibition. And I will let her introduce uh, uh, the artists that we invited. <clears throat> um, of the artists, uh, uh, Cynthia Hooper and Adam Chin will get uh, uh, more uh, time <clears throat> because they are new to the lasers. Uh, Terry Berlier uh, has been a, a laser speaker how many times? Three times? And, and most, most recently last year. <clears throat> And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, have a we'll open a conversation. We'll, we'll use this exhibition as a springboard to have a broader discussion on uh, not so much engineering, but on re-engineering. I think Terry would call it tinkering with, uh, you know, with the repurposing. Uh, I liked the, the, something that was in the page of the exhibition, the repurposing human civilization. Um, so I will all introduce Glory and John, and then I will let Glory introduce the artist. So Glory Simmons is director of the Thatcher Gallery at USF. She's also a poet and fiction writer uh, and a former Stegner Fellow at Stanford University. And she has received the numerous awards, awards uh, for her poetry and fiction. Uh, my introduction is notoriously brief. Uh, there's a, there's a a web page, lasertalks.com, has the longer uh, bios with links uh, to their websites. And John Campbell is professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley. He is the author of books uh, uh, Past Space and Self and the Reference and Consciousness. And I don't know if you wrote any other books. That's uh, OK. Good. <clears throat> Glory, um, turn it over to you. Thank you, Piero, and, and thank you, everybody who's out there joining us today for um, and connecting with the exhibition Pulled Apart um, at the Thatcher Gallery. We're really excited to work with Laser, and I have to um, say especially thank you to Piero because we looked at past Laser um, talks to look for artists, um, so we we're really relying on um, the people that you've brought together, so thank you for that. Uh, for people who don't know, the Thatcher Gallery is a public art space at the University of San Francisco. We focus on art by um, Californians and um, art uh, collections that are in California. And um, at this time, like, like most, um, we are presenting online exhibitions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to tell you just a little bit more about the, this exhibition. Okay, so Pulled Apart features five artists, Terry Burlier, Adam Chin, Cynthia Hooper, Carrie Hott, and Gail White. The artworks range from paintings to photography, kinetic sculpture to video and digital prints. Um, all of the artworks uh, reveal some aspect and in one way or another, um, the hidden or overlooked systems at play around us. Uh, Pulled Apart was um, created as a collaboration with USF's brand new engineering program. So um, the online exhibition has a page for each artist where you'll find their artwork, videos, um, artist statements, and then um, sometimes talk about their processes. Um, in addition, there is a um, reflection by a USF engineering professor on each page. And um, each artist um, also starts kind of their page by posing a question. Um, in addition, we also hosted three conversations between engineers at USF and different kind of um, groupings of the artists. So that's how um, the exhibition was created. Um, and I guess for me, what's 
what's really um, strikes me right away is just how different each artist's approaches are. Um, you know, the, the vast um, kind of range of mediums, but then um, what's been the pleasure is really finding the ways in which each of these artists intersect with each other. Um, so I'm going to just use that as my jumping point to give you a very tiny taste of the show. Um, this is just the beginning and I hope you'll really um, explore the exhibition further online and I'll share that link on in the chat in a, in a little while. So the two artists you see here, Adam Chin and Carrie Hott, use computer technology, smart devices, AI, and machine learning as collaborators in creating their art. Um, and in, you know, for Adam, um, he's using neural network algorithms to provide the information needed for a computer to create a face with really mixed results. I think you could say. Um, and then Carrie is presenting five um, videos uh, that really focus on a desk and then a voice interacting with smart technology that's in the room. And through that conversation, the room begins to change. Um, so you can see all five videos on her page. And then in this slide, you're seeing um, samples of work by the three remaining artists. You have Terry Berlier's Kinetic Sculptures Self Leveler, um, Gail White's Anatomical Study of a Butterfly, and then Cynthia's Lush Landscape Painting of a Landfill near her home in Humboldt. So all of these very different works are really drawing our attention to the human interference and also connection with the environment from sea level rise, ecology, and land use. And I think they, they all are doing it in very subtle ways. Um, and so together, that's the, the quick teaser, together these five artists' works remind us of all of the engineering and the systems that are around us and the possibilities, but also are reminding us to think about our relationship with those systems. Um, and then today you'll be meeting three of the artists, Terry, Adam, and Cynthia. Terry Berlier is an interdisciplinary artist whose kinetic sculptures investigate human interaction with queerness and ecologies. They are an associate professor and direct the sculpture lab in the Department of Art and Art History at Stanford. Um, Adam Chin is a fine art photographer who spent a career as a computer graphics artist for TV and film. He studied photography and printmaking under Barry Umstead at Reiko Photography in San Francisco. And Cynthia Hooper's videos, essays, paintings, and research-based projects examine and interpret infrastructural landscapes in the United States and Mexico. And she currently lives and teaches in Humboldt Cal County, California. So now I'll turn it over to our, our speakers. These oil paintings of my local landfill are currently featured in the Pulled Apart exhibition at USF. They describe the modest infrastructural elements that control the landfill's waste products, including methane and leachate, and prevents these toxins from escaping the site. My artistic practice examines infrastructural landscapes and their myriad cultural and biological entanglements. Sites that include altered watersheds, reconstructed wilderness, brownfields, power grids, and industrial farmland. My work patiently frames and makes sensible the incidental and emblematic activities that define these complex places and deploys sensory strategies alongside disciplined research. Some of my East Mojave paintings are also featured in the Pulled Apart exhibition. These works examine the instrumentation found at a research center in the Mojave Desert. Nestled within their dramatic landscapes, these unassuming contraptions stoically perform plotting tasks in the service of science, including monitoring the atmosphere overhead or sensing subtle tectonic movements underfoot. Some of my Tijuana paintings are also featured in the Pulled Apart exhibition. These works examine the handmade homes and DIY infrastructure of several informal communities on the outskirts of the city. These resourcefully improvised homes are made from recycled garage doors gleaned from teardowns in suburban Southern California. 
These handmade communities were built in response to NAFTA fueled population explosions along the US-Mexico border over the last 30 years. I also made non-narrative videos about these informal communities, architectural and infrastructural strategies, including the delivery and disposal of water, power, and waste. These works meditate on the resourceful and courageous ways that people build critical infrastructure for their communities when government entities will not or cannot do this task for them. For much of my recent career, I focused on making videos and essays. I've long been compelled by the industrial sublime, and my videos examine post-industrial landscapes, resource extraction economies, and infrastructural systems that distribute power and water. Many of these landscapes are close to my home region in far northern California. The video still on the upper left is an image of California's last remaining pulp mill, shut down for good in 2008 and soon to be demolished. The still on the lower left documents a turbidity reduction tank at my community's municipal water facility. The still on the lower right is an image of a controversial outfall pipe from a dredging operation that took place on a local beach in 2007. Always these places are politicized sites, but sometimes the controversy isn't super obvious. I'm not always focused on clear evidence of environmental devastation, but the two places you see here can look pretty apocalyptic. On the top is a still from my two channel video, Westlands, the largest and most politically powerful agricultural district in the nation. Westlands has long been a central and controversial player in the California water wars. On the bottom is a still from my two channel video, Geothermo Electrica Cerro Prieto, which examines the luminous and archetypal mechanical features of a vast geothermal energy field in Baja California. Sometimes I document sites simply because I think they are ravishingly and phenomenologically beautiful. I'm also really interested in infrastructural entanglements with non-human life forms, and have made videos and written about incidentally and deliberately manufactured wild places. The video still on the upper left documents the wastewater outfall of a manufactured wetland in Baja, California. The one on the lower left documents the Kern National Wildlife Refuge, where wildlife is dependent, like many human Californians, on the pumps and canals of the state water project. The lower right still is an image of the once mighty San Joaquin River, where the flow in one spot is restrained by a culvert. This is an installation view of my negotiable utopia project, where I examine California's Humboldt Bay from a variety of perspectives, aesthetic, sociological, environmental, and economic. It's an example of how I paired my videos and essays as two discrete entities. My videos don't have narrative voiceovers in the manner of traditional documentaries or essay films. That content is reserved for the essays that gallery goers can read if they want to. Sometimes the metaphorical capacity of moving images with their expansive inclusivity is simply sufficient for a viewer. I've also published both the videos and essays in online formats where it's easy to invocate the content. This is an installation view of my cultivated ecologies project where I examine the reconstructed wetlands of California's Central Valley. The Central Valley once had nearly 4 million acres of primeval wetlands. Now just over 200,000 acres of valley wetlands remain, most of it artificially constructed and actively managed. I examine this constellation of habitats scattered across the valley and how infrastructure, both mechanical and jurisdictional, keeps these ecologically critical sites alive. This project is now published online in Places Journal. Infrastructure certainly provisions the public in many good ways, power, water, safety, and capital accumulation, to name a few, but it also can be highly selective about who gets this good stuff such as the case with the Klamath River in Northern California and Southern Oregon. My video, Jefferson's Monuments, which is included in the Pulled Apart exhibit, describes four monumental Klamath dams in their dramatic cascade range environment. These are the dams that will soon be taken down. When the demolition begins in 2023, their removal will be the largest salmon restoration effort ever undertaken. I made this video in 2010 the year the first major legislation was passed to kickstart the process of removing these dams, but this effort began decades before that. I'm gonna show you a short clip from this video, but first I wanna give you a small slice of context for understanding this watershed. 
This is a map of the Klamath River Basin, the third largest river system within California. Its upper half is located in the mythical 51st state of Jefferson between California and Oregon, a place that embraces libertarian and historically settler colonial values, including anti-taxation, limited government, gun rights, and economic reliance on resource extraction-based industries. The Federal Klamath Project was built to drain a vast system of upper basin marshes and lakes for agricultural homesteading. This project includes a network of canals, pumps, and dams that reclaimed 225,000 acres for the production of alfalfa, potatoes, and various grain crops. Because of the upper basin's mountainous terrain, cheap hydroelectric power for pumping irrigation water was part of the plan. Damming the Klamath for this power seemed like a logical decision back then at least for the white settlers. Enter the dams. COPCO 1 and COPCO 2 dams were built in 1918 and 1925. The acronym COPCO stands for the California Oregon Power Company. The company that owns the dams now is Pacific Corp, which is a subsidiary of the Berkshire Hathaway Corporation. J.C. Boyle Dam was completed in 1958. An Iron Gate Dam was completed in 1962. Iron Gate is the lowermost dam on the Klamath. The construction of Iron Gate Dam cut the watershed nearly in half. This has been particularly hard on the Spring Run Chinook salmon, who traditionally spawn and rear in high elevation cold water habitat. The Klamath Basin Spring Run Chinook could go extinct within 50 years if these dams aren't removed. In fact, they're nearly extinct now. The spring run are the fattest and most tasty of all runs of salmon, and indigenous communities have forever organized their food sources and rituals around the return of this particular fish. More than 90% of all the basin salmonids are gone. There's more to saving fish than removing migration barriers, though. There's restoring spawning gravel, side channels, and floodplains that were lost to hydraulic mining, dams, and diversions. There's restoring riparian corridors critical for cooling streams and offering protection from predation. There's restoring cold water flows to allow migration and protection from deadly pathogens and toxic algae. There's also the planning required for a basin-wide flow regime that's becoming less dependent on gradual snowmelt and more so on fast-moving rain. This is a map of ancestral indigenous land occupation, not the current occupation, unfortunately. The upper basin Klamath tribes have long strived to restore their historical water rights as well as their upper basin fisheries. Without access to salmon, the middle basin Karuk people cannot maintain their traditional life ways and healthy food ways. Wrecking the river is akin to wrecking their grocery store and their church. Karuk scientists and resource managers have worked for decades to restore salmon habitat on the Klamath and on its mid basin tributaries. The same goes for the Yurok and Hoopa people who have long fought for their fishing rights and cultural survival. All these tribes have deployed decades of science, advocacy, direct action, and traditional ecological knowledge in pursuit of dam removal. It's been primarily through their efforts that the Klamath River will be restored. Let me introduce the stars or rather the villains of my seven minute movie, Jefferson's Monuments. This video still features Copco One Dam Built in 1918, it's the oldest monumental dam in the West. It was also the Klamath's first dam to completely cut off anadromous fish habitat. This video still features Copco 2 Dam, immediately downriver from Copco 1. This still features the penstock for J.C. Boyle Dam. This gigantic water pipe uses gravity flow to accelerate water pressure to power two turbines that create 90 megawatts of electricity. Of all the Klamath dams, J.C. Boyle Dam is the most efficient producer of power, but this value is mostly exported out of the basin. Standing near these pen stocks is a pretty viscerally powerful experience, a sensorial clash between the counter forces of industrialization and bucolic nature. Infrastructure is everywhere in our environment, yet sometimes it's deliberately hidden from view. I had to drive many miles of dirt road to get to the spot to take this photo. This video still features the gigantic spillway of Iron Gate Dam. The sheer physical presence of forms like this one can rival the grandeur of Gothic cathedrals or ancient pyramids. Their aesthetics can also mask the complex web of social and capital transactions they transmit. 
In this case, the transfer of wealth in the form of water resources from downriver tribes to upriver irrigators. These forms also offer up public debate about how effectively and equitably infrastructure serves a common good. In the case of the Klamath dams, this debate has dramatically intensified in recent decades. Forms like this also embody the language of hydraulics and engineering, a lexicon I personally know next to nothing about, but still can intuit that language because it's baked into this shape. In this video still, the X form that this irrigation infrastructure creates seems to cancel out this landscape's original morphology and function. My filming this massive sprinkler system also morphs this quotidian and helpful device into something that seems more mysterious and menacing. I'll admit that as an artist, I traffic in an immersive and metaphorical visual logic that operates outside of a specific narrative context. Yet I still want that context preserved somewhere, hopefully nearby. Here's a short video clip from Jefferson's Monuments. You can watch the entire video in the Pulled Apart exhibition. The second scene in the clip you just watched is of J.C. Boyle Reservoir with Mount McLaughlin in the distance. Here's a view of that same site just above J.C. Boyle Dam from Google Earth. You can see all the toxic algae from space, all that bright green stuff. This harmful and even deadly stuff will be gone once the dams are removed. Thank you. Okay. Okay, next. Um. I guess I can go. Yep. I'll jump in. Yeah. Hi. Um, well, my name's Adam Shin, um, and I'm an artist. And what I do is I'm working on combining photography and artificial intelligence, or photography and machine learning. Um, my background is um, well, I came out of Stanford in the computer science department in the early 1980s, and um, I've been working as uh, I worked at, been working as a computer graphics professional that entire time. And so when I got out of school, I was looking for a place where I could make pictures on the computer. And um, I found a company at the time, it was called Pacific Data Images or PDI. Um, and there were only about four places in the country at the time where you could make pictures on the computer because this is right before the introduction. Uh, right before the introduction of the Macintosh computer. And actually, um, so at the, so for the entire 40 years, I've worked at the, inter, uh, at the intersection of art and technology. And at PDI, what we did back then was we were making television graphics. Uh, we made, we were making like the openings of Monday Night Football and uh, we would fly the, um, you know, the NBC Peacock and network IDs. And actually, I just want to do a shout out that two of the um, original founders of PDI, uh, Richard Chung and Carl Rosendahl, um, are in the audience here tonight. So I want to say hello to them. Um, anyway, PDI went on to become part of DreamWorks Animation, and we went on to make Shrek and um, movies like Madagascar and How to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda. So I got to witness and participate that entire thing. Um, but really what I learned in the early days when we, when we first uh, started, when the company was really young was how to explore with the computer to make images. So I wanna fast forward to around the year um, uh, 2015 
And I'm, I, I now work independently. And I was working by myself at the time. And I was asking a very simple question. And that is, can you make pictures using artificial intelligence? Okay, so the, this AI thing was hitting real big. And I said, can you make pictures with it? And it wasn't really obvious at the time how you would go about and do it. Um, so I went and did some research. Uh, turns out it was really hard. <laughs> um, it involved a lot of programming and reading a lot of scientific uh, papers. So I ended up taking a couple of um, online courses in uh, machine learning. And then I had to go out and find databases of pictures to train the neural nets on in order for me to make new, photo, uh, new pictures or new photographs. So I'm gonna show you two series of images that I made uh, sort of with machine learning. And um, here, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So the first thing, um, there's about 13% African-American uh, percentage of African Americans in the population. So this database had a racial bias to it. And this fact really bugged me because I didn't know, well, if I start using it, what's going to happen if you, if, if you have this bias? And then the other thing that bothered me was I felt like uh, the men inside it were being exploited, even though I kind of assumed that most of them were dead there, uh, and there were no names to them. You don't know what crimes they committed. Um, and it looks like the, the photos were taken between the 1930s and the 1970s. Uh, nonetheless, I was so dis disturbed by it that I put it away. I just, I walked away from the database and said, you know, I, I can't work with this. And about a year later, um, I came back to it and I still needed faces to work on. And all I had was this database. And, and so what I said to myself at that time is, okay, then maybe that's what this whole project is gonna be about. If I, if I decide to use this, then it's my responsibility to, to talk about the problems that I, what I'm seeing inside. Um, and so that was the deal that I made with myself and I'm gonna show you what I made and I'll show you what I made. Okay, so what we have here, this is uh, the first of a series of diptychs I made. Um, I trained the neural net on 500 pairs of the guys that you saw just before this. And then after I trained the neural net, I input one picture, the picture on the right here, the profile view, and I had the neural net predict and try to draw what it thought the, the face, the front view of this guy looked like. Okay, so here's another one. Here's, I do the opposite, I went the opposite direction. I in, uh, input a, a front view and try to predict the profile view, view. And you can see that it's actually kind of cool. I mean, it is actually kind of working and it was working well enough for me to say, you know, I, I think, you know, in time that this is, uh, there, it's gonna get here. Um, but, and then, then as I continued to work, I had other sort of disturbing thoughts about what I was doing here. Um, at the time there were protests in the media going on in Hong Kong. There were pro-democracy protesters and um, the Chinese government was using facial recognition software on uh, closed circuit TV footage of the protesters taking to the subways and they were IDing people. You know, they, they would, you know, the facial recognition would, would recognize the people's faces. And I looked at what I was doing here and I realized, ooh, this, could be like the next step. You know, here's the Chinese government, but they're putting labels on these on these images, and I'm drawing pictures of the guy. So it was very disturbing to realize that something I was doing, I was trying to do a life drawing exercise, but it, it was very disturbing to realize how easily this could be abused in the future. Um, and one other problem that I had uh, as as I kept looking at it. The other thought I had was accuracy, you know, so like how accurate is this photo of the person, particularly if you were using it in a, in a facial recognition uh, situation, because I know that given what I've done, you know, at home, you know, I get this rough blurry drawing, but in a couple of years, this image on the left here is going to get sharper. 
uh, and it's going to get more photorealistic looking, you know, give it five years. Um, but the question still holds. When we get to that point five years from now, is that image going to be, are you going to get a sharper image of the right guy or a sharper image of the wrong guy? And, and that's the question that, that uh, started to bother me. Actually, it, even now, we're having the first cases in the United States of uh, misidentifications with facial recognition software. Um, I think we have three cases that have come out in the last year uh, where they've arrested the wrong person based on facial recognition. And in each case, the person being arrested was African-American. So anyway, so there's problems. Um, I, the second series is the series of uh, artwork is what we, is, we are showing in the Pulled Apart exhibition. And luckily this series doesn't have the ethical problems <laughs> that the prior one did. Um, this is a series of portraits that I've made and it uses this algorithm and you don't have to remember the name, but I, in short, it's called Sagan. And what this algorithm does is it takes a set of photos of arbitrary images and tries to characterize, learn what, what's in those photos and, try, and then tries to draw uh, images like the photos in the set. So here is what I based it on. Okay, this is, um, there's a database. Well, actually, when you first start learning machine learning, and some of you out there may have actually done this, there's a very early exer exercise or tutorial, and it's called the handwritten digits exercise. And what you do is you read in this database from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, same guy, same guys, and you, you input this, database and then you have the computer try to learn and draw digits just like these. So the idea is after a while, the it's an iterative process where the neural net tries to get better and better at drawing zeros and ones and fives and nines, et cetera. So I was looking at that exercise uh, one day and I thought to myself, what if I replace the database with 800 photographs of myself? <laughs> okay, so I, I, so what I did one day is I got set up my camera and I took 800 pictures of myself and I fed it into the algorithm. And this is what I made. It's a, it's a self portrait of myself. Um, and this is the algorithm trying to figure out what I look like. Um, during the course of the uh, training, uh, you know, of the neural net training, I had the algorithm um, would I ha would have the algorithm spit out uh, images of myself every hundred cycles and saying, "Show me where, show me what where you uh, what, what you what you've got at this point." And by the time I finished training, I had about ten thousand of these images, and out of those ten thousand, I picked these 16 images as my, you know, these represent my portrait. And here's one uh, I made of my friend, Joel. Again, I generated 10,000 of him, picked out these 16. And the point of this is that the, that last step where I, the human, pick out 16 images of Joel, uh, 16 images which I feel represent Joel out of the 10,000, that's the step that the computer can't do. That's the aesthetic step or the art step. The, the computer can blindly generate uh, 10,000 images of Joel, but you know, it takes a person still to figure out, is this Joel? And, and so we're asking the question of this is, when is an image a portrait? You know, what makes that, these 16 out of 10,000 a portrait and the other ones not a portrait? Um, and here is um, one more of my friend Dina. Uh, one of the interesting things that uh, we did in making this portrait was that we couldn't get close to each other because of COVID. And so I gave uh, each of the subjects, I gave her the remote controller and she stood there and could trigger the camera. So she, she actually took the pictures herself. So it was like 800 selfies. And as a result, the, the, the photos that she took of herself were better than the photos that I could have taken if I had stood there and blasted away and tried to get 800 
photos of her. Um, this is um, the same process using uh, of Obama. And, and what I did here was that I went to Flickr and I downloaded 1200 images of Obama. These are the uh, Pete Souza uh, photos uh, from the White House stream there. And I trained it on those 1200 photos. And it's, it was a much more difficult task for the, the computer because Obama was in a lot of different positions and different lighting um, in those photographs. Here's one more of me. This was taken, I did this during the first week of the quarantine last March. Um, during that first week, I realized I had all day to take 800 photos of myself. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was, you know, the artistic benefit of being locked down. And, oh, here's, here's some of the, uh, these are some of the photos I took of myself, and this is what goes into the neural net. Okay, 800 photos like this. And here are some of the Obama photos from the Pete Souza photos from Flickr. And you can see that he's in much more varied positions. And so it was much harder for the, uh, com for the algorithm to converge on a coherent image of Obama. And the last thing I'm gonna show here is the 30, 30 second video of the training of, this is, this is the actual raw output of the neural net training process. So if you go to the Pulled Apart website, you'll see the entire video. It's three and a half minutes long. I really encourage you to do it because in those three and a half minutes, you'll see the 8,000 or, or 10,000 images of Joel. But here it is. Okay, so that's it. There's two and a half minutes more of that exciting um, <laughs> neural net training. So I'm gonna stop here and pass it on to Terry. All right, All right thank you. Uh, let me get my screen share. So in my practice, I interweave movement, sound, objects, and I'm inv investigating the human interaction with queerness and ecology specifically. Um, it's tools to recover and animate our faltering connections with self, queerness, nature, and society, often using hu humor. Collaborators include engineers, composers, architects, scientists, I approach my creative practice as a playful, open-ended um, experimental process, whether taking apart an instrument, a toy, everyday object, or an old technology, I look for ways to reappropriate systems to speak to my queer body experience. This way of working for me is a queer phenomenological approach, which speaks to ways of working, how I understand and orientate myself towards the systems I take part in and, and use in my practice. Most recently, I have been using desire lines, the landscape architecture term for marks left on the ground when one veers from the normative path as a point of departure to explore queer persistence. These deviations leave temporary paths that used repeatedly change the landscape they address the small and particular ways we move, delineate, and protect ourselves amidst environmental and political crises. I'm interested in calling attention to forced invisibility together with attempts to see oneself to, and to be seen. Just before the pandemic, I began to immerse myself in researching queer archives. Um, I examine 
collective responses to political threat and those repeated microaggressions and interactions enacted in everyday life. I was also interested in queer visibility in contexts like the one I grew up in where overt queer identification feels unsafe. Conceptually, my work weaves between world instability with overlapping environmental, political, and social, social crises to querying the possible and enduring, even grasping pursuit of a sense of completion. I utilize a variety of tactics, including humor, failure, and altered mechanical systems to emote human interactions and idioms. My work lends form and visibility to those things that are often felt but unseen. And here's a, a part of a video that's also in the exhibition. Um, I'll just play part of it. So I think I'll stop there so we can have a conversation. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Am I frozen? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah this, uh, this happened a few times. Anyway, okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentations. I think uh, there's a lot we could discuss here. Uh, I would also be interested in discussing what is a portrait and what is a self-portrait. Uh, lots of philosophical issues here. Uh, but I, I wanted to start with something that intrigued me from the very beginning when I saw the, the page about this exhibition. I was talking about the mechanisms, uh, gadgets, uh, objects that work, and that the title of the exhibition is pulled apart so the idea that you pull apart a system and you see how it works. And that made me think about a um, big difference between my, my grandfather's generation and myself. Uh, my, my, my grandfather lived in the, in the countryside. Uh, uh, he was a poor man, uh, but he knew how things operate. He, 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 could, uh, he could fix anything in the house from the plumbing to the electrical. And he knew, he knew very well how his motorcycle worked. He certainly knew how his bicycle worked. And today, of course, we mostly don't know how things work. We just know that we press a button and something happens, but we turn the key of the car and the car starts moving. So that, that started me thinking <clears throat> about, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, the importance of tinkering, to use a word that uh, Terry has used, uh, that, that we don't do normally. I mean, most of us, we just use things. Um, and instead, some artists actually tinker, re-engineer, use materials, build something. And, and uh, so they have to dismantle something and then build something else. So what, what we <coughs> non-artists lose um, by not disassembling things, by not looking inside how things work, and right now I'm talking about the object, but of course you could also think of bigger systems like the infrastructure that that's artists like Cynthia uh, uh, deal with. Uh, many objects together created an infrastructure that makes our civilization work. And so, so, so uh, you guys have thought about this. Uh, what what we what we miss 
um, when we don't know how things work and uh, what do artists grasp? What kind of uh, uh, meaning they grasp when they disassemble something and then use the material to build something else? I mean, I, I guess, I think there's like a certain discovery or um, understanding that comes from taking something apart. And, and I think also there's like a critical inquiry to the things as well in terms of you could take objects or systems for granted or just live within them as opposed to questioning why they are the way they are why do we have these devices were they invented for military use and now they've become everyday use um, and i think it you know you have to really examine what power structures are at play as you kind of, you know, you know, I think there's so many levels to it that are so interesting. Um, and I know, I, I think I was also surrounded by many tinkers growing up here. So I think like, you know, my father had like a, my, the, the, our children's playroom was situated between my mom's sewing area where she made all our clothes and my dad's like wood shop where he had like, I remember as a kid that he had, you know, replaced the washing machine motor, but then he turned that into a belt sander. But most of my childhood was spent like, why does the belt sander just go in a loop? And why doesn't it agitate like a washing machine? And so just these sort of questions that, that made me want to like look into that deeper and, and under, I think it's a way of understanding and learning and grasping your environment for me. And also, it's a way to, I mean, the way I approach dismantling landscapes is, is oftentimes a, a legislative approach. Like, I'll, I'll start with, a, like, the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement, this landmark piece of legislation that, you know, was 20 years in the making, and uh, kind of go from there, or environmental impact reports, or, you know, reading the Federal Register, <laughs> just all these sort of nerdy legislative uh, policy documents that help me to dismantle the mechanics of a landscape in the political landscape that you know shapes the the anthropogenic anthropogenic uh, material that it, that's built up from it so yeah for me it's it really starts with with policy um, that's how I take apart landscapes. <laughs> and then I go out and do you know, research in the field and, and learn more about the ground truthing, the physical dimensions, the material dimensions of the place. Um, I, I wanted to talk about <clears throat> two things really. Um, and this goes back to the beginnings of uh, Pacific Data Images where I was working with Carl and Richard back then. And <clears throat> like I said, we were, the, we, we didn't call it tinkering, but I, I always called it play. And, and that we were, we, what we were, we were engineers at this little company, but if we had one thing in common, we were all frustrated artists. So that's, um, we, we were there just to get our hands on the computer. The, the actual day job of making television graphics was, was pretty superfluous. Um, I want to think of, I, was thinking about this question in terms of machine learning. And one of the common things that happens when you start taking apart machine learning, um, the first reaction you have is, oh, there's no intelligence in here. Okay, there's no AI, there's no intelligence in AI. And you see the system inside there and it's based on probabilities. So that's the demystification that you go through. Um, in terms of, why it is mystified, why the mystification is happening. I, I, I don't know the answer. I suspect it's corporate, you know, that the, the advertisers are trying to cloud up these systems to, so they can sell us things, um, you know, because to, you know, they can, it's easier to sell magic, you know, because once you get the simple explanation, you may see, not see that, oh, there's not that much real value in here. So, um, I don't know the philosophical reasons, but I, you know, I suspect there are those, those are some of the commercial reasons. 
I had actually, uh, can I come in here, Piero? Yes, of course. I, I, I had actually taken a slightly different message from um, the intersections between the artworks. And I, I'd like to try this on you. It, it, it seems to me that um, uh, it, it's been one of the big ideas of science that the way you understand things is by busting them down to the atoms and you figure out what the elements are. And then you understand, and then you understand how they're all put together to make the thing you started with. And that's how you understand the world. But today, I think things seem, don't really seem to lend themselves to that kind of understanding so well. I have a friend actually in Stanford whose teenage son got very interested in TVs. He really wanted to understand how a television worked. So he got himself um, an instruction book on how to make a TV. He went to Fry's, um, as it then was, and got all the bits and put them together and built a functioning TV, quite an achievement. But of course, at the end of the exercise, he still had no idea how a TV worked. Um, I mean, it just, it just doesn't work with the, the, the same way. And um, when Terry is looking at... Um, this social disintegration and collapse and repairs and uh, how we put it together or with Cynthia's stuff about um, uh, how you're doing running repairs to the landscape and your environment. Um, it seemed to me that um, um, really we're in an environment where very often what we do is not really understand how the whole system works, how the whole social environment is working, really. We, we know the elements, roughly, but we don't really know uh, how the whole thing is functioning. What we do is running repairs. What, what we do is, in Terry's word, tinkering. And we don't really have this kind of overview or with the pixels we don't really quite understand why this looks like a face and this doesn't even though we're getting the elements very well and what's really valuable from artists it seems to me is to give us a step back picture of what is going on here give us a broader vision of how these complicated structures that we don't really understand any of us. I mean, it's not like there's a specialist somewhere who really does know all about it. And if we could only ask them, none of us really understand what's going on with the social structures that queerness is trying to um, habilitate and, 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 and so on. But um, it's very valuable to have this vision of what is going on, what we have here with the um, Mojave or whatever in, in Cynthia's work. That, that was how it was seeming to me as I looked at the exhibition. It sounded a little different when you talked, but I'm, but I'm not sure. But don't you think that <clears throat> without knowing, so we, we, we have um, uh, not only movies and, and, uh, and novels, but we, we have discussions where uh, we, we, we see two polarizing views of, uh, of machines or systems where on one hand we mythologize them, on another hand we criminalize them. And, and, and to me, it sounds like both extremes uh, are, are not really right. Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think that that happens because we don't really know how things work? Uh, and, and AI is a good example. People who know how AI works usually are not that afraid of it. In fact, they will tell you, we still have a lot of tinkering to do <laughs> to make it um, really uh, useful in, a, in, a, in so many fields. So don't you think that without knowing how it works, then we have, I would say the wrong perception of, of the things that are around us? Certainly, I mean, we're all, you know, very intellectually siloed and, and I think it's the responsibility of artists to sort of think and create more discursively than is comfortable for us all to do so and that that's really risky, you know, to get out of your, your, <laughs> your track of, of thinking and, and the way that you operate your life and the way that you organize your life and and also your the specific expertise that you learned in in university <laughs> amongst your colleagues so yeah it's super risky business you always feel like you know am i going to do justice to the group tribe struggle over you know trying to restore their salmon habitat i mean my god <laughs> 
they've been doing this for you know 150 years <laughs> struggling for sovereignty struggling for identity you know dare i even approach that topic you know how how gracefully and how sympathetically can i not being a crew tribal member myself so yeah it's always it's always risky business <laughs> to to think you know broadly discursively wildly outside of your siloed perspective but you know artists are just always taking those risks scientists are too everybody who has an intellectual agenda feels like they have to do that you're just compelled to do it <laughs> yeah and uh, I would like to add uh, Carrie Hott, who's also in this exhibit. She was um, talking about um, how these we have these uh, AI systems in our homes now, Alexa or Siri or Google Home. And um, so if you're if you're challenging, you know, how these, you know, having these systems in your home, you're fighting a very large corporate power there. Um, because they're really interested in selling you these things and putting these things in your home. And the fact is, uh, I'm actually very leery about them. You know, after looking at how, what I do know about AI, and I have some knowledge and, um, you know, and, and your, what Carrie's work was showing was that, you know, she was asking where are the, you know, you, if you ask Siri, you know, who's the, I don't know, what year was Abraham Lincoln born or something like that, the question was, is where is that answer coming from? And um, we've, we've given up that, you know, uh, that territory. We're, we're, we, we are trusting that device and I'm not sure if we should. Yeah, I think I'm also just interested in sort of changing the, the you know, changing an object or a toy's function to say something else, just like very directly. Um, so just like using maybe something that's familiar, but altering it and I don't know, strange queerness to it, I guess. And just like, it's like, I think it's like a language that we can play with um, and hopefully, um, yeah, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, within a critical framework, you know, and kind of questioning. I mean, I'm not saying like when I take anything apart, I totally understand it any better, but I, you know, I guess there is some, I mean, I think for me, it's more about the discovery, you know, that's happening within that system. Yeah. I think one thing that comes up with the corporate interests that maybe connects to what Piero was saying about the um, suspicion of technology is a feeling that um, when we don't really, when we can't really get our minds around it, the worry is that the technology, it's not even that corporate interests are coming in, it's that the technology maybe in some way we don't really understand taking on a life of its own. I mean, in Thomas Pynchon's uh, Gravity's Rainbow, one of the ideas is that the reason the Second World War, I mean, I'm not, I don't know if this is, I don't say this is particularly plausible, but it's a very interesting idea. The reason the Second World War happened was that um, the technology of missile um, development had reached a stage at which a war was really necessary in order to get the tech tested. Um, it, the tech really couldn't progress at that point any further without a proper war where everything could be uh, laid out. And I remember in my university in the 90s, before um, whatever we had to connect us to the web before Ethernet, that um, w w someone said to me, you'll have to get a new Ethernet lead for your computer. And I said, what's Ethernet? You know, what I have is working perfectly fine. And they said, well, all the sockets are being replaced with Ethernet sockets. You have to upgrade. And it's not that anyone was really saying this is what we want. It's just this is what the tech demanded, so we all had to do it. And I think there is that concern that when the tech is so imperfectly understood by any of us, it may just be taking on this life of its own that is not malignant, but not benevolent either. It's just running its own way without any particular and everybody working in tech has got to keep pushing up and getting working on these slopes that um 
are, are defined for them, but no one's in charge, uh, 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 as with the racism and the surveillance. These things are just happening, and it's not necessarily that they're coordinated. It's just the tech is doing this on its own uh, in, in that kind of wave. Does that ring a bell, Adam? Is, oh, 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 it scares oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's uh, that's uh, that actually this oh. this brings back memories of a French philosopher that right now I can't remember his name in the eighties, and he was talking about uh, uh, the evolution of objects, just like we talk about the evolution of life, and that the object uh, have uh, some kind of goal, and they are the ones that drive uh, uh, what we call civilization. Course, I'm not using the right words. So, so I'm sure there is there is uh, there is um, some elements uh, uh, there. Um, I also want to go back to something Terry said about discovery. Uh, maybe for you a discovery, but actually, what I appreciate in what you and some other friends do, I, as you know, probably know that I have a few friends who are kinetic sculptures, um, is not only you disassemble and assemble, but you walk the path that other humans have walked before. See, when, 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 when I say that I don't know how to build a, a, a TV set, it also means that I will never experience what the inventor of the TV set, what the average engineer and so on uh, experiences. So that, that, I mean, that maybe it's not a big deal, but I will never, uh, uh, walk that path that other humans have walked. And I think you, in a sense, walk that path when you build something. So I think, to me, as an observer, you do more than just discovery. Uh, if you just wanted to do discovery, I mean, we met on a, on a hiking trail, as you remember. Well, that's discovery. But I think you do a little more when you, when you disassemble something, reassemble it, when you, when you really try to figure out what, how can I combine these, these materials. And you point at different ways to do it, different paths to follow. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, I don't. Um, yeah, and I and I'm using these mechanisms to like emote things and to talk about like a human experience, right? Like I feel, I guess I see motion and sound as like very human elements that that can do things and can speak to you know, climate change, or it can speak to, um, you know, queer failure, or it can speak to um, queer family. I don't, I don't know, like it, it I, I, I don't know, there's sort of a magic to me that happens when you sort of reinvent objects that weren't meant to go together in this capitalist sense of consumer usage, right, or or, or using the land the way symphonies is together, or using these computer systems the way they were meant to, you know, track these these uh, these people that Adam's looking at. Like, so I think there's ways that you, yeah, I think the artists have sort of are able to take this deeper inquiry that maybe exposes the the failures of these systems right or the shortcomings of them and questions like as Cynthia was saying like it's terrifying what some of them are doing right and or or um, what you're talking about John like there's no limit to the tech like and there's no like I, I just don't understand that we have all these resources and we but there's no sort of sense of like how do we how, like care for humanity with the kindness or like like, why can't we use them? Why does it have to be about this sort of ego manifestation as opposed to like a, um, you know, like why can't we solve world hunger or something? Like we know we can do it. <clears throat> I don't know, I got I went kind of deep there, but <laughs> I think it's just like, there's, you know, there's such a good, there's so much potential, right? In all these systems. And yet they we're often looking at them and questioning them because it may be, you know, maybe it's because the, they're not being driven or whoever's driving them. And, and I don't know. Um, I had a, an interesting thought during the, when the pandemic started and I was, you know, trapped at home taking photos of myself and, you know, and here we have this really sophisticated 
AI thing going on, you know, where I can feed in all these photos and make new photos. And yet we're still laid low by this medieval plague that's going on outside. And, and I, I found it really ironic. That Not only we, that, we yeah. didn't have toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You know, it, you know, so here I am playing with this AI thing on the computer in my house, but you know, we, we, we were, we're not in control of, of this plague and we're laid low by a medieval plague, really. Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess there's a broader topic um, um, that is uh, how we coexist uh, with the objects that we create that how we coexist in particular today with the machines. It's not only machines, but by the way, I, I sometimes I also think of furniture and, and uh, uh, humble machines like appliances, but machines obviously are getting more and more uh, uh, pervasive and more, uh, uh, I don't want to use the term intelligent, but they certainly do more things. Uh, in fact, I was in, a, in a Hangzhou, a big Chinese city one day, it was early morning, and you think of it, and it was a train station, and you think of a train station in China is a very crowded place, right? Well, I have pictures. I, there were two or three human beings, but there was a machine that sells food. There was a machine selling the ticket. There was a machine to take pictures. Uh, there was a machine selling toys. And to get, into, to get to the train, I had to go through a machine that was checking my luggage, put my ticket in a machine. And then of course, the train itself is just a robot today. It's, it's all. So we're actually surrounded, increasingly surrounded by, by, by objects that we build and more and more intelligent. So I guess the broader question is how to coexist with them. And I don't know if there is a, a, a philosopher, a moral philosopher who's studying the ethics of, uh, of coexisting with, uh, with, with this increasingly pervasive and quote unquote intelligent objects that we're building. Um, I had a thought uh, when you had sent us an email earlier, there was one other machine that we are completely involved with, uh, some of us like eight to 10 hours a day, and that's the browser, okay? This is, you know, like Chrome or Safari or Firefox or Internet Explorer. And I've done a little bit of programming inside the browser. Um, I'm not very good at it. it but once you get inside there, you realize this is a real, just this is a machine. I mean, it's a really complicated machine and you're back there trying to program every little widget and thing that you're seeing on the screen. So here it is, I can spend eight hours a day there, you know, in the browser, you're not even on any other part of my computer. So, and I'm completely involved with it. So in some ways I, I'm married to it at this point. I can't divorce myself from that experience. And I don't know what that's doing to us as a culture. Yeah, I don't have, I don't have an answer, but that's a machine. Once I got inside and started learning how to program it, you know, ooh, this, you know, it's, it's levers and knobs and buttons. I don't know. It seems like when I first started painting machines, I don't know, 20 years ago, it, it, I, I was so naive. I mean, I, I just had the sanguine, you know, attitude that oh these are beautiful things they're so the juxtaposition of them in the nat in nature is, is really compelling and I don't know yeah I, and in the machines I deal with in my work now are, are really you know archaic <laughs> compared to the machine technology that Adam is using for example so it's just very sort of anachronistic this old-fashioned you know pipes and plumbing and just sort of basic mechanical stuff that I have this affinity for and I almost retreat to that nostalgic attitude of <laughs> the machinery of the past. <laughs> it's a comforting thought. I mean, it was you know devastating to the environment like the Klamath River dams are, but, um, but yeah, the old fashioned machinery just is, I don't know, sometimes do you wish for those olden days? <laughs> and, and Terry's work is very mechanical too. You know, you're, you're dealing with basic engineering principles I, I there's for the most part i mean there's some high-tech elements certainly in, in your work but um you're also dealing with old tech yeah you yeah it's a little bit of both i mean i think it's 
I mean, I think what's fun for me is, you know, I've just, I've said it before, is it's just, it's kind of questioning those systems, right? But whether it's the archaic system or the high tech system, they ultimately are systems that are controlling us or their power structures that we're, you know, that we're dependent on them in some way. I mean, you know, or the cell phone is like religion, like people are, you know, look to it as this, you know, sort of guiding force if they're not, if you're not kind of questioning your usage of it, right? So I think there's, um, yeah, so I think for me, it's just always about trying to take those apart and try to really, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying I can live without it by any means, um, but they, I think it, there has to be an awareness of how they are, you know, sort of directing us. John, John, you, you have uh, you have thoughts on the, on the, on, the, on the, how we socialize with machines? Well, there's an analogy that was occurring to me as I was looking at the exhibits, which is um, the way animals use tools. I mean, as I understand it, in the history of people studying animal tool use. Uh, something that's periodically happened, I mean, it's happened a number of times, is that you find an animal using a tool like um, a bird will carefully select a stick of just the right size and shape and then modify it a little bit so it's just right for opening a coconut um, or get, getting um, ants from a nest or um, what, for a purpose it has. And people say, look, it made the tool, is using the tool. It understands what's going on. Animals are so smart. And then the history of the subject is that you vary the task just a little bit. You say, um, uh, try to use the stick for this purpose, or here's a stick that's not quite right, but see what you can do with it. And the animal can't do it. It can't do it at all. So the animal is like someone who's got a phrase book knowledge of a language, you know, where you, you, you'd you make your first visit to France and you look at the phrase book and you say, bonjour, monsieur. And um, then you've got a torrent that you can't do anything with and you're looking back at your phrase book for the next gen. So, uh, so you thought you had a general purpose understanding of the language, but you don't really, you've just got this very specific thing you can do. And when you see the thing about animal tool use, what strikes you first is a con contrast with humans. You take someone using a hammer and a chisel and you think, well, I know how that works. Or with one of Terry's mechanical installations where you say you see the shoes going up and down and you say, oh yeah, I see, I know how a pulley works. I know how that works. Um, but with present day tech tools, of course, I mean, with a hammer and chisel, if you vary the wood, um, you know what to do. You hit it harder, you hit it more gently, you press it with, rather than hammering, or you try giving it a bash with the handle. You, you, you know, you can use it in multi-purpose ways because you understand exactly what's going on. I think that's what Cynthia means when she's talking about nostalgia for the old days. You know, when you had tools that were like the hammer and chisel, you, you know, you, you knew what was going on, you knew why it was working. But nowadays, you know, you take a remote and you press a button and okay, it works. And if it doesn't work, I have no idea what to do. Or if it, if it does something unexpected, I have no idea what's gonna happen now. Or if society isn't working uh, properly, what do we do? I have no idea. You know, I, I'm, I have my phrase book understanding of these things. I can slot in, in my specific pre-assigned way, but I don't have any flexibility. I don't, and I don't have any control. Um, and I'm kind of alienated from my tools in the way that the animals are. I, I, I've just got something with this one purpose and I don't have that kind of inner comprehension of how the whole thing goes. I, but, you know. I, I think there's another difference uh, uh, with the animal tools. I, I mean, we, we make objects that move. Uh, and I think that has created a lot of... Uh, uh, separation between us and the objects. Our some of our artifacts move, uh, and you know that it starts. I don't know with a with a windmill, with a whatever, and and now today, of course, we have cars and spaceships and uh, 
and microwave ovens, whatever, they all move, they all have a mechanism that move. Uh, so I guess because we learn how to use energy, uh, but I see that's another big difference, right? And that, that uh, creates a whole new universe of, uh, of uh, objects that... that uh, mm. One of the differences I could see when we're looking at Terry's work, you know, there is something that, that the, some of this tech work lacks that a well-made machine is something you kind of want to touch. And there's this feeling of touch that I think is really important too. You, you call it like a good machine when you got one and, and we're, uh, and, and that's something that's really lacking in the, the tech world is, is, is sort of the tactile uh, the tactile nature of things. Um, and oh, I think yeah. that's part of your nostalgia. And also just the graceful aesthetics. I mean, you're really trafficking in this just gorgeous, beautiful, you know, imagery that just is so mesmerizing and hypnotic the way it moves. And, and yeah, it, it's really transcendent of the, um, the content that you say the work is about, I mean, there, it's really operating on a lot of different levels, you know, because you say one thing about the work, but then the work has, has this real standalone, iconic, aesthetic beauty that's just really, you know, an autonomous experience, a totally phenomenological experience that's just very transcendent and lovely. And, you know, that's what artists want to do. That's what we traffic in, you know, and yet we have, you know, agendas, we have political agendas, we have social agendas, you know, how to imbricate the two, how to get the agenda to work with the aesthetics, how to work and, and operate in, in ponderous metaphorical ways and yet, and yet still have enough specificity, enough expository content to, to forward whatever agenda we're trying to get through to the world, you know, whatever injustice we see, whatever, uh, uh, problem we want to help solve you know how do how do we pull that off as visual artists i mean i'm always grappling with that i'm always you know like i don't want to be too didactic and <laughs> but i i can't help it sometimes like, you know i mean sometimes a didactic approach or an expository approach is, is the best way to get a, a specific idea across if you're if you're trafficking in social justice issues you know so how do you handle that, Terry? <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I think. I mean, I think it's just like I. You, I feel like you go. Um, I feel like it's like a pendulum where you like. You know, maybe it's like I have one piece that goes really um, high tech and maybe says a lot, and then maybe I swing super analog and try to go more aesthetic because I feel like something was maybe heavy handed, and so I think it's just constantly trying to find that balance or that temperature or that um i don't know or the right tool that fits the the conversation that you're interested in having you know um i mean just back to tools too like i i mean of course that like i i love tools you know like just the thought of like tool porn came up to me like just like <laughs> thinking like all of these like the old technology the new technologies the whatever or a shoe or a hammer like some of them are just so beautifully made that you can kind of get lost in that or want to know like how how could I make this shoe um or you know like I think there's sort of um yeah I mean I think it's just kind of a constant searching and grasping and I think um I balancing think, and recalibrating you know all of the imperatives you have for your work you know yeah and also like I get I think I have this uh, I want to I just play with a lot of materials and and mediums because I, I tend to get bored or um, if I am not sort of forced to learn something while I'm making it, you know, like what is the saying? Like if I knew how to make it, what what would be the purpose of making it? So I think there's sort of like, um, like I guess that's where tinkering comes in. Like I just play, sometimes I'll play in the studio and the, um, the idea will come from the making and I consider that you know, thinking um, as, and sometimes the concept is just right there or it comes from the saying, like waiting for the other shoe to drop um, and feeling like that's like, how could I, how could that, that could speak to many things. Um, but then like, what would that feel like to be in the room with that? And so like, how do you, 
how do you get the, I guess it's, I'm often looking for how to make the work create that feeling that I want. Yeah, that ineffable, you know, aesthetic pleasure feeling <laughs> that we all traffic in. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And that's so, we can't explain it really how it comes together. It just, yeah, it's a really intuitive thing. And it's hard to explain to non-artists too, you know. Like yeah, that. and I, I mean, it's talking, working with students here. I mean, I know you guys teach as well. And it's like just hoping and off, giving them enough guidance and, and helping them to learn to trust that their instincts and their, um, you know their intuition or their ideas so they can follow them to to an end or not surely not an end maybe more maybe it's more of a beginning or mm -hmm. um, a path to to wander on yeah absolutely i i as a listening i must i'm finding well one 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 thing i mean sometimes uh, when artists talk about their work uh, she's like a play, you know, like like a, 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 an evolution of children's play where uh, now you call it tinkering, but somebody could say, well, children also try to do things. And by the way, children break things. Children break a toy. Uh, sometimes the toy that they ask for, and then they break it. They want to see what's inside. I don't know. They want to see how it works. So the discovery we're talking about is also to some extent a biological instinct, right? Where as, as children, we want to see what's inside. And then we grow up, I guess we get distracted by bills to pay, mortgage and, and whatever else. And we are not curious anymore how, how that machine works. We're not curious anymore what's inside my couch. Yeah, I guess artists never lose that curiosity. <laughs> We're always, always thinking <laughs> what's going on what's the yeah. story behind this landscape that I'm driving through right now? You know, who owns the land? Where does the electricity come from? You know, who built these roads? <laughs> what crop is this? <laughs> what's the geology underneath my, the soil here? You know, I can't never stop thinking about that. Like what types of plant species grow on this hillside? You know, stuff like that. It's constant. Well, I think what you're saying, Cynthia, is, is that you're, what I'm saying is, is you have to be open to these things as well and open to, you know, what's going on in the world. And, that, and that's kind of a, 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 a that's, not an, that's not a given, you know, because and, and I think the example I, I could use is that, you know, with the, the mugshot images that I was making, I was trying to do a life drawing exercise, <laughs> okay? And I stumbled into this very deep political realm you know, but by just being, yeah. you know, it says, oh, there's a protest going on in Hong Kong. And, and it's like, oh, there's a racial, you know, and I, you know, and I, it, it, so I, I progressed very, very quickly to this completely other place with, okay. with complete political <laughs> dimensions. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, if you pursue it and pursue it and pursue it, it's amazing the places your mind can go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and that's, I think a dangerous, it feels kind of dangerous to be so investigatory about the world around us. Like the powers that be don't want us to think very deeply about the way our society is structured. And yeah, it feels kind of creepy because you can't stop being that way. You know, you can't stop thinking investigatively about every, every aspect of life around you as an artist or as a researcher, or any kind of thinker is gonna be that way. And so, yeah, we're, we're kind of dangerous people, <laughs> even though we're really nerdy and, you know, we have academic jobs or, you know, <laughs> we've never broken the law. <laughs> we still <laughs> feel like, you know, we're kind of dangerous to the powers that be. I don't know. Do you guys feel that way? <laughs> I think it's just speaking as a consumer, it's so easy to get into a real confusion between what's familiar and what you understand. And to think, well, you know, I, I, I've known this for 20 years. I, I, I use this every day. I understand it perfectly well, but without understanding it a bit. You, you know, I mean, um, like the comedian Steve Martin used to have a sketch where um, you, you're cryogenically frozen. You, you wake up in 200 years and they say to you, electricity, 
what was life like that like back then? Tell us about electricity. How did that work? And you're like, well, it kind of came out of the wall. Um, <laughs> you know, really, then you've shot your bolt. You know, <laughs> or Wi-Fi. How did that work? Well, it's kind of like that, um, and that's really all you have. Um, but of course, it's e so easy for us all to think, yes, we understand these things perfectly well, um, because they're so familiar, we use them a dozen times a day. And it seems to me that something artists are doing is notoriously defamiliarizing us, saying, look at this, isn't this weird? <laughs> you know, don't, we don't know what's going on here at all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. We do defamiliarize the world. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way of putting it, John. Totally. Yeah, or what uh, was it? Is it Alvin Noe who talks about strange tools? Yes. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, so it's the same idea around that kind of decontextualizing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, very good. Anybody has uh, some uh, final words of wisdom? Oh, well, I, I just want to thank Lori um, for putting this exhibit together and the series of talks and the catalog was so beautiful. If you get a chance, any of you listening here get a chance to get your hands on a PDF of the catalog. It's just a, a, a gorgeous document. <laughs> it's so, so nice. Thank you so much. I just want to thank the artists, you know, Terry and Adam and everyone who's been involved in this, in this uh, pulled apart exhibit. It's been so wonderful to work with engineers too at USF. And, you know, I got to work with Lou Sassoubre, um, an environmental engineer, and we had hours and hours of conversations about, you know, anadromous fish and, and genetic analysis of winter run Chinook and all kinds of stuff, genetic analysis of like the, the waste outfall at, you know, the Punta Bandera a wastewater treatment plant in in Tijuana, Mexico, just all kinds of really obscure things that were just so wonderful. So to get a your to be able to spend some substantive time with scientists is a super, super wonderful thing for me. So thank you, Lori. <laughs> thank you for putting this together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks everybody for being a part of this exhibition and and thanks Caro and John for also continuing the conversation along. Yeah, um, it's yeah. been yeah, it's been a fun way to approach it. And I know I had a great time talking to my engineer and artist as well. So it's been it's been such a treat. Hey, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice evening. And I thank everybody for listening. And uh, uh, let's go and break a few more things and uh, rebuild them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was such a pleasure. Thank you.